You're listening to the 12 Days of Christmas. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Today we get to share with you the story behind the hymns of Christmas. Our guest, Benjamin Kologi, he's a member of Faith Lutheran Church in Plano, Texas, a professional church organist and composer and contributor to the Lutheran service book, Hymnal Companion, and one of our favorite guests to chat with us about hymns here on KFUO. And it is so nice to have you with us today, Benjamin. Thanks for being our guest. Thanks for inviting me, Indian Sarah. All right, let's take a look at some Christmas hymns. Shall we start with From Heaven Above? Indeed, that sounds like a great place to start. Hymn 358 in LSB. Luther, he wrote three Christmas hymns and he translated a few others, but I would really say this is probably his most famous. I, I hope we all sing this at Christmas time. But if you turn to it and in LSB, the first thing you notice is that it's very long. And if you recall in Lutheran worship, our previous hymnal, it was divided into two sections. I guess that was so that it would make it easier to sing or something. But in LSB, it's back in 15 stanzas. And I think that's a good idea. It helps us to follow this narrative. But let's get into this a little bit about the text. And we know from the hymnal, we have this information on the page that Luther wrote both the text and the tune. And I really think the character of these stanzas, it's almost childlike, not dogmatic. Uh, Luther's not trying to get into deep theology here, but he's trying to present the story of the angel proclaiming Christ's birth in words that are dramatic. And some hymnologists have even suggested that Luther might have intended this for home and family use rather than church liturgical use. Makes perfect sense. So we wonder, how might Luther have used this hymn with his own family? And so I think maybe as we start, let's think about this hymn in terms of childhood drama. And and that's kind of like how I'd like to talk about it today. But think of all those components of a drama, whether you're talking about maybe a Greek drama or Shakespeare drama or a church Christmas program. You know, they all have characters, they have different emotions, and all of which are related in a manner that the audience can understand. And so there's some lesson or teaching imparted to us. So this hymn itself is based on Luke 2, 10 through 14, which we read, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Now, back to the hymn. This first stanza is kind of a teaser. The angel, he has to establish his credibility here. He says, from heaven above I come. After which, of course, he brings good news to every home and glad tidings of great joy, at which, of course, he promises to tell us. And I have to say, this opening stanza might have been, Luther may have been, parodying a type of folk song of the era called a garland song. It was a little love song, and the details don't really concern us here, but the first stanza to this little garland song read, I come here from foreign lands and bring much news to you. I bring so much of the news to you more than I will tell you here. (laughs) So even this little garland song is enticing us to listen. And so Luther uses that to entice us to listen to what's happening next. But Luther's hymn doesn't leave us hanging. So the next four stanzas quote the angel as this angel proclaims Christ's birth and tells who Christ is and what he's here to do. So Christ is born this night, a child of Mary, virgin mild. He shall be the joy of all the earth. He hears your sad and bitter cry. The angel says, he will himself your savior be from all your sins to set us free. And this is it. I, I, I think, of course, Christmas is about giving gifts, isn't it? And Luther uses what we already know and expect about gift giving. And he writes, he will on you the gifts bestow, prepared by God for all below, that in his kingdom bright and fair, you may with us his glory share. So these are the angel's words. It's this gift of eternal life that Jesus is bringing. And so that we can share in it. These are real gifts. But then I think it's kind of shocking how the angel concludes these words. He tells us that Christ who brings this gift of eternal life. He's born in swaddling clothes and manger dark. 
There we will find the infant laid by whom the heavens and earth were made. And I mean, this is quite a marvel. The God of creation and the universe has been born in some hole in the wall farm outside of Bethlehem. So if this hymn were being dramatized for a church play, I think these, I mean, how do we do that? I, I think perhaps we'd have somebody dressed up as an angel. That's how I see it in my mind anyways. And very charming, I suppose, delivering these lines. And, but then the perspective of the hymn changes, doesn't it? In stanza six, the angel steps aside for it's a congregation who responds, how glad we'll be to find it so. Then with the shepherds, let us go to see what God for us has done in sending us his own dear son. And they're looking at stanza seven. I almost get the sense that I'm reading the narration of a Sunday school pageant director. You know, <laughs> someone who's trying to convey the instructions to the children. The children are off on the wings, the side of the chancel, maybe they're dressed, already dressed as shepherds. And they're ready to gather around the baby Jesus. And so the Sunday school director perhaps says, come here, my friends, lift up your eyes and see what in the manger lies. Who is this child so young and fair? It is the Christ child lying there. And maybe all the children gather around the, the crest then. And of course, the children respond then, the next verse, welcome to earth, O noble guest, through whom the sinful world is blessed. You came to share my misery that you might share your joy with me. And I guess I'm just myself a graduate of way too many Christmas programs because that's how I'm, I'm seeing this. <laughs> because, because the next stanzas kind of suggest maybe that time where the children gather around the major with their little favorite plushies situated. They're, they're trying to illustrate a pleasing farm scene, regardless of the historical inaccuracy, inaccuracies of it all. But they're, they're, they're singing, um, all aboard, though you create it all, how weak you are, so poor and small that you should choose to lay your head where lowly cattle lately fed. And so again, here we have to respond to this in stanza 10. Were earth a thousand times as fair and set with gold and jewels rare, if it be far too poor and small a cradle for the Lord of all. And I don't know about you, but this kind of reminds me of that verse in Isaac Watts a couple centuries later in his great Latin hymn, When I Surveyed Wonders Cross. He wrote, mm -hmm. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a treasure far, far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I think Watts knew Luther when he wrote this. But then in the final stanzas of From Heaven Above, we take what we've learned and we just rejoice in it. Stanza 13 is a great children's prayer. Ah, dearest Jesus, holy child, prepare a bed soft undefiled, a quiet chamber set apart for you to dwell within my heart. And in fact, my children's choir sang this stanza, among others, this year as we sang this hymn in a dramatized fashion. And so we continue. My heart for very joy must leap. My lips no more can silence keep. I too must sing with joyful tongue that sweetest ancient cradle song. And of course, we finish with a doxology, full throated with everybody joining in. So I think the key to this hymn is drama. I, I really don't think that this hymn was meant to be sung by a congregation, all 15 stanzas with absolutely no variation. I know that's often how this, this, this hymn is used, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Sometimes that's all we can do. But I think at minimal, the stanzas can be divided by different sections of the congregation. If you have a choir, maybe to emphasize the different perspectives. I, 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 I think drama is the key. And for example, this year for my lessons and carols, I took my musicians and spread them at the four corners of the church. I had a harpsichord in the front corner, some recorders on another, bra brass and organ in the back. And I had an angel and the choir leads in the back who took the role of different roles and the congregation joining in at six with the children's choir and just divided it up. And I guarantee you, it goes by really fast. It's really quite exciting. And I think this is the sort of dramatization that Luther really had in mind when he composed this text. I mean, what greater way to tell the story of the incarnation in such a clear and concise manner? And I think maybe too, to conclude, I think it reminds me of 2 Corinthians 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, he say, for, for your sake he became poor. So the you, by his poverty, might become rich. 
So that takes us a bit through this great Christmas hymn. I love the connections that you made and the I could I could see the the Christmas pageant as you're as you're talking through this hymn. I love all of that imagery of 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 the children gathering around the manger and that that I don't know. I love the drama of that too. I think I I hope we can do that one time in our church to to have this hymn kind of as this as this drama with with the children. And the connection that you made between this hymn and the the Lenten hymn, it it makes so much sense and and putting together those two seasons is just fantastic. Oh, and hymn writers knew each other's work. So Watts mm-hmm. certainly knew Luther. Luther was important as a hymn writer. That was fantastic. I love the personal examples, too. Though what a great connection to these great Christmas hymns. We have more conversations in the days ahead here on the 12 Days of Christmas. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. <laughs>